Welcome to the Associates of the Boston Public Library's Literary Spotlights. I am Alice Lee, a member of the Associates Board of Directors. In a year without a pandemic, the Associates would be hosting our annual celebration of authors, books, and libraries at our Literary Lights Dinner. But the dinner for reasons of public health has been postponed to September 19th when we hope it will be once again safe to gather together. Literary Lights is not only a festive celebration, it also raises funds in support of the Associates mission to preserve and protect the remarkable treasures that reside in the Boston Public Library's special collections, including rare books and manuscripts, stunning prints and photographs, and important cultural artifacts. Tonight, we want to offer you a preview of Literary Lights in the form of an interview with one of the authors we will honor in the fall, the award-winning writer and naturalist, Cy Montgomery. Cy is interviewed by Christy Cashman, one of the dinner's co-chairs, in a program we have dubbed Literary Spotlights. We hope you enjoy their conversation and that you will plan to join us in person in September for the Literary Lights Dinner. Cy Montgomery is the author of 30 books. She writes for both adults and children, effortlessly matching prose to audience. She has won awards too numerous to mention, but including nonfiction honors from both the New England Independent Booksellers and the Children's Book Guild, as well as the Henry Berg Award for Nonfiction from the ASPCA. Perhaps her best known work, The Soul of an Octopus, was a finalist for the 2015 National Book Award. And it is with this book, that I'd like to begin. It is such a gift, actually, to be able to talk to you about your work, your book, everything that you do. So thank you for coming on and joining us. No, well, thanks for having having me on. <laughs> um, did you get the memo about kicking off the interview with a with reading a few passages from The Soul of an Octopus? Yes, yes. The one. Um, it was a few paragraphs starting with um, starting with chapter one. That's correct. Yeah. And I'm happy to do that. Do you mind? That would be awesome. Not at all. Let's start. That's great. Okay. Thank you. On a rare warm day in mid-March, when the snow was melting into mud in New Hampshire, I traveled to Boston, where everyone was strolling along the harbor or sitting on benches licking ice cream cones. But I quit the blessed sunlight for the moist, dim sanctuary of the New England Aquarium. I had a date with a giant Pacific octopus. I knew little about octopuses, not even that the scientifically correct plural is not octopi, as I'd always believed. It turns out you can't put a Latin ending, I, on a word derived from Greek, such as octopus. But what I did know intrigued me. Here was an animal with venom like a snake, a beak like a parrot, and ink like an old fashioned pen. It can weigh as much as a man and stretch as long as a car. Yet it can pour its baggy boneless body through an opening the size of an orange. It can change color and shape. It can taste with its skin. Most fascinating of all, I had read that octopuses are smart. This bore out what scant experience I already had. Like many who visit octopuses in public aquariums, I've often had the feeling that the octopus I was watching was watching me back with an interest as keen as my own. How could that be? It's hard to find an animal more unlike a human than an octopus. Their bodies aren't organized like ours. We go head, body, limbs. They go body, head, limbs. Their mouths are in their armpits. 
or if you prefer to liken their arms to our lower instead of upper extremities between their legs, they breathe water. Their appendages are covered with dexterous grasping suckers, a structure for which no mammal has an equivalent. And not only are octopuses on the opposite side of the great vertebral divide that separates the backboned creatures such as mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, and fish from everything else, they are classified within the invertebrates as mollusks, as are slugs and snails and clams, animals that are not particularly renowned for their intellect. Clams don't even have brains. More than half a billion years ago, the lineage that would lead to octopuses and the one leading to humans separated. Was it possible, I wondered, to reach another mind on the other side of that divide? Octopuses represent the great mystery of the other. They seem completely alien, and yet their world, the ocean, comprises far more of the Earth, 70% of its surface area, but more than 90% of its habitable space than does land. Most animals on this planet live in the ocean, and most of them are invertebrates. Thank you so much. I love, love, love your description, your word choice, how automatically you open up this world of, as you said, the other. It's just um, so fantastic. Uh, I guess let's start by talking about the invertebrate. And what was your, what was it that prompted you to explore them in the first place? Well, I'd always wanted to write invertebrates, but I didn't think it was time. I didn't think I was wise enough. And I also wasn't sure that readers were ready um, for a book in which invertebrates were characters, were individuals who loved their lives as much as we love ours. And, you know, I'd written, at that point, I'd written, gosh, like 28, 25 books. Um, only one, a book uh, for young readers, had been about an invertebrate. It was about, actually, um, tarantulas who are long lived animals, some of whom have behaviors that, that would be very familiar to mammals. Some of them have maternal care, for example, but except for this one uh, spider who I got to know, her name was Clarabelle, uh, and she was a wild tarantula who I kind of got to know for a couple of weeks. I, I have never really like had a relationship with an invertebrate animal that lasted very long. Part of this is because, you know, most of the invertebrates that we encounter, um, they they don't they don't live that long. They are living on a, a different scale than we are. Yeah. You know, um, they may be doing all kinds of important stuff, but we might not be able to see it. We we n might not be able to find them over and over again to get to know them. Yeah. But octopuses, particularly a captive octopus, that's someone you can get to know. So. That is so interesting. Um, one of my favorite quotes is by John Muir. I think we talked about this. Uh, when you tug at a single thing in nature, you find it attached to the rest of the world. And I feel like that's exactly what you did with your book. You exemplified that in a way by putting a microscope on the octopus and letting us see close up and personal what their life is, what their world is. You really opened that door. You were the bridge in so many ways. Um, for the human world to the world of the octopus. Um, it's predators, everything about it. And I guess the question is, is the senses, how can we, how can you best describe the octopus's senses and feelings, if you will? Well, interestingly, I think it's, it's almost easier to describe their feelings than their senses. And here's why. Um, I, there's only one part of our skin that can taste, and that's our tongues. Um, so we do have a little entryway to that. But because our, we're constrained by bones, because we breathe air and not water, because we can't pour our boneless bodies through a tiny opening the size 
of of we of an orange. We can't change change color. Um, we live in a completely different medium. It is, it is really hard to um, to imagine what it feels like to experience the world as an octopus does. But we have very similar neurotransmitters. And when you talk about emotions, emotions to our, our knowledge are essentially caused by neurotransmitters and we have the same ones. So of course, you know, I can't, even though you and I are very simpatico, um, I can't truly know what it feels like to be you. Um, there's always going to be that separation. But, you know, you and I have the same neurotransmitters as a snail. I mean, every time people have looked, scientists have looked for a particular neurotransmitter in any taxa, they have found it or something just like it. For example, oxytocin which is known as this, the, the cuddle hormone. This is the hormone that makes, that helps us uh, fall in love, that helps us love our babies and not drop them off on the neighbor's step the first time it cries or needs its diapers change. It's a very powerful hormone. Cuddle and, hormone? Yeah, it's known as the cuddle hormone, oxytocin. Okay. It's just okay. one of, of the many um, neurotransmitters or hormones that's associated with powerful emotions. And, and we know it's an affiliative hormone that um, also just helps with every bonding experience. Well, octopuses are not particularly social animals. They don't give birth the way we do. They, they have eggs, which they guard. But most octopuses don't live much past the hatching of their babies, which is very tragic. And yet they have a hormone so like oxytocin it's called cephalotocin for cephalopod. So I think that we probably do have a lot of this, the same feelings that almost all of animate creation has. Now, what we can't do, we don't want to project onto other animals feelings that are our own. We don't want to project onto other people feelings that are our own. But we do all the time. Every time you buy someone the perfect birthday present and they hate it, that's when we projected onto them something that that we felt and wished that they did. And right. we do that with, with people as, as well. And we don't want to do that with animals. Otherwise, we would be taking all the fish out of the water, rescuing them, right? Um, <laughs> exactly. Or, you know, I, you and I would be rolling in horse manure because clearly our dogs love it. <laughs> I haven't tried that, but they do love it. <laughs> they do love it. And, you know, have you noticed almost everyone likes to eat chicken manure? And I have, I mean, everyone loves it. And I keep thinking, like, am I really missing something here? <laughs> <laughs> My dog's all the time at the park are always doing that. Yeah. You know, I was going to ask you that as a scientist, um, is it difficult to... Uh, explain or uh, share your research with other scientists who still believe that animals, you know, react to instinct alone. But in some ways, you you've proven it scientifically that they don't only react to instinct. Right, 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 right. Well, um, I can see that. I'm not a scientist, you know. I'm just a writer, but um scientists themselves i think know this a lot more than they're willing to to uh. learn frequently i mean i've i've known a number of researchers who have seen animals do things and know why the animals are doing it but never published those findings because they were afraid that they would be you know laughed off the island but yeah. i think all of us who know another animal very well um have have seen them do things that absolutely show that they're they're not automatons. Um, and by the same token, you know, we humans do an awful lot by instinct that we would like to pretend is our, our powerful intellect at work, but it's it's really just instinctual. And some some of the most important decisions we make in our lives are made according to our our gut or our our 
our instincts, our intuitions, and not thought through carefully. So sometimes I think we give we give instinct short shrift. Yes. Well, I loved your response to the picture I sent you last night where I said, if jellyfish can survive for millions of years without a brain, it gives some people some hope. <laughs> and what was your response? It, it was like brains are overrated. Yes, I, mean, I, I, I knew someone as a sunflower sea star who lived in the same tank with the octopuses. They, they live for a long time normally. They're big animals and they are, they're starfish, but these guys have more than five rays. They're large. And this was a male. And he did not, you know, none of them have brains. Um, in fact, some, some animals, when they're developing embryonically, they start growing a brain and then it's like they think better of it <laughs> and then they restore it. But anyway, so he doesn't have a brain. But when we would feed the octopuses, this sunflower sea star would often come over to try to get something to eat. And he had no brain and yet he recognized here's some food. Well, sunflower sea stars will also eat octopus eggs. And one time he was moseying over to see Octavia, one of the octopuses had laid eggs and just moseying over to take a look at, at the egg situation. And she came thundering out of her little hair with her tentacles up. And he backed the heck off as fast as he could <laughs> and did that without the benefit of a brain. And um, trees, for example, trees don't have brains, but if you look at what's been called the wood wide web, which I'm sure you've heard about these. I have not I love that though. Oh, oh it's so cool. Um, folks who've studied trees have recently discovered that trees are connected underground by not only their rootlets, but uh, networks of mycelia, which is fungal growth. Um, and they can communicate with each other in this way. They communicate things like, oh my gosh, there's some insects munching me. And then the next door tree will start making in its leaves anti-insect. No way. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes trees will help other trees in distress and they will funnel nutrients via this wood wide web. And what does the wood wide web look like? It looks like our nerves you know how they they start out big and then they start branching and then they they reach toward each other and then there's like a little space a synapse and that's when one nerve will send some neurochemical to the other nerve and then the message keeps traveling that's exactly what it looks like plants and animals have their own language is what you're saying and we have to sort of or you as the writer has to sort of dumb it down for us to understand it, to create a bridge, right? So that we can relate to it, which I wanted to ask you, is there any harm in that? Is there any harm, do you think, in that sort of anthropomorphizing, is that the word? Um, uh, creatures and plants and things, because in some ways it's kind of saying, it's our world and you're just living in it, when we use our language and our feelings to describe something that is, you know, an animal or a plant, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I totally hear what you're saying. And um, the problem is, of course, the only language we have is ours. The only senses that we have are ours. I, I think the greater problem is in denying living creatures thoughts and feelings and memory and agency we know that that is a tremendous moral hazard. It's a tremendous scientific hazard. One of the, the major uh, keys that's acknowledged in understanding animals today is something that was totally frowned on 40, 50 years ago, and that is identifying individual animals. And prior to like 1960, most people who studied animals, ethologists, did not name their study subjects and did not try to distinguish this hyena from that hyena or this chimpanzee from that chimpanzee. 
um, that was not to be done because there was the chimp behavior, the hyena behavior, the horse behavior. But any of us who've had and lived with an animal knows that they're just as individual as we are, even if we can't see it. And, you know, some, sometimes, I mean, we even do this with other humans. We totally do this with other humans. You, you look at a group of people who all have the same color skin and the same kind of hair, and oh, they all look alike to us. Well, they don't look alike at all, um, but we need, we need to learn to see. And that's one of the wonderful things about animals is that they, they can lead us via their senses to a larger appreciation of the real world. They can let us see the true nature of the world because it's much larger than what we experience with just our limited senses. In, this, in the same way that, you know, what if, what if you only read one book your whole life? What if you only, you know, ate one food? What if you only listened to one piece of music? Your life would be impoverished. And I feel this way about people who haven't had the benefit of making friends with someone of another species. Mm -hmm. So true. It's funny, you brought up horses and I won't name names, but my friend Tracy was going out one day, it wasn't that cold and she put a blanket on her horse. And I said, why are you putting a blanket on? him now and she said because I'm cold <laughs> yeah I remember my mother used to do that all the time she would say put on a sweater I'm cold but children <laughs> children aren't cold the way adults get cold no, and I know. you know that is the problem with anthropomorphizing that right. the point that you bring up is is totally legit to project onto others something that you yourself want but your point that that is our language and that's that's all we have and it's limited, yes, but nonetheless, it's all we have is also very valid. It seems like the octopus is so extremely complicated. And what we think of as a brain, it's not like they don't have that same process, just a different way of of reacting, correct? Yeah, their brains are so different from ours, you wouldn't even recognize it was a brain. First of all, it's it's a ring around their throat. I mean, our our brain and most mammal brains kind of look like a walnut um, in its shell, the shell being the skull, you know. And there's, you know, we have a bunch of different lobes and um, but you look at you look at an octopus and it's this ring around their throat with between 75 to 100 lobes, depending on how you count the lobes. And their arms can operate independently of their central brain. And in fact, I've even read that some scientists postulate that octopuses have some shy arms and some bold arms, which might mean that octopuses have a different sense of self than than do. They may have a sense of we. Um, yeah, I know. So who kn who knows? And you know what octopuses show me? I think what what they have made evidence and evident in my life is is something that's not an original observation at all. This is something that is attributed to Thales and Miletus. Um, that the universe is alive and has fire in it and is full of gods. I mean, to me, what they show us is that every creature in our world is far more vividly alive than we can imagine with our limited senses and has fire in it, you know, is, is brilliant, is um, incandescent in its abilities and its vivacity and is full of gods, that they are as holy as anything we can imagine. Yeah. It feels like that when, um, when I was reading your book, it, it, it makes it feel sacred, you know, that there's Thank you. sacred. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that is what, um, is so special about how you write and how you bring so Gosh, thank you. the other world to us. And so thank you for doing that. Um, we talked a little bit about the 
the more than human world. And I think that's what you're basically describing um, is that all of this animal life around us, all of this plant life, we just tend to look past and not at. And your writing, I think what you bring to the world is this ability to make us really look at something that we might ordinarily look past because we can't think of how to relate to an invertebrate or a plant or a weasel in your chicken coop, like <laughs> you wrote about in your book. Um, you've said that animals are the gateway creatures. Yeah, well, <laughs> dogs are like the gateway drug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that's so true. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Once you once you knew a, know a dog, I mean, for me, then the barn door was open. <laughs> I wanted to meet everybody. So true, right? And that's, I think, that's everybody's sort of starting place, right? Their dog, their cat, their horse, mm. their parakeet, and. And that's, they can be a bridge in so many ways. They can be a bridge because most people do have pets that they can relate to. How do we keep that, that feeling of um, really knowing how important it is to carry that with us all the time, all the time thinking of the other species that we're sharing this world with? That's brilliant and, and super important. Um, in the world's religions, the way that we honor God or the gods is usually many times a day you do something to worship him or her. You may, you know, pray facing Mecca many times a day, or or um, in or you you may avoid eating certain foods because the scriptures tell you not to do that, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I think that with animals. And the way we carry this forward is we now want to behave in a way that either benefits or at least stops hurting these other species. And we often don't realize, for example, that you go to the grocery store and, and you, you come home with something in a big plastic bag. You don't think of it. You don't think like, golly, you know what? There's, there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2050. And this plastic bag that I'm lugging my groceries home in is, is going to strangle a, a, a whale, a seal, you know, a seabird. We, we don't even, we don't realize that. But if, if you are touched, if you are moved by another's predicament or by another animal's life story, the next step is to carry it forward into your everyday life in that in your behavior, you get to do something to benefit them. And the great thing is that we all in our everyday actions can live in a way that honors and preserves the natural world. A lot of the lessons of COVID, COVID has been so hard and, and a vicious, horrible virus. And I, I want it to go away. But it has taught us some lessons. And probably I have read that the biggest um, conservation uh, achievement of many decades was accomplished simply by having fewer cars on the road. Wow. That, that saved more animals than like any recent legislation, than any you know preservation effort just simply failing to run animals over in our cars because we weren't commuting to work we yeah. were able to to save all these creatures lives and there's lots of stuff like that i think that covid has has shown us it's shown us a lot of us the joys of being outdoors because you you couldn't be going to 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 watch a, a play or a symphony or or a movie or go to a restaurant but you could go walking in the park and Absolutely. if you get to do that, I mean, then you get to maybe meet some fabulous critters and even know we're there and maybe start watching them and start caring about them. Your next book, The Hummingbird's Gift. What were you drawn to about 
the hummingbird. Well, what drew me to hummingbirds was the fact that birds, all birds, are really made of air. I mean, they literally are made out of air. They are hollow creatures, most of them. Uh, there's, there's a few with bones that are not hollow, but most birds have hollow bones. Their, their feathers are hollow. The colors of their feathers are created because of different air spaces. Um, they have huge air sacs in their bodies. And no other bird illustrates this better than the hummingbird, the this hundreds of species of hummingbirds. And they're, they're so vulnerable because of this. And yet it's this vulnerability that gives them their superpowers. The fastest bird in the world, if you're looking at body lengths, is not the peregrine falcon, but it is one of the species of hummingbirds. As it dives down in its nuptial dance, this bird is faster even if you're measuring it by body lengths per second than even the space shuttle. Also, the largest, the longest migrant in the world is not the albatross, if you're looking at body lengths, but again, it's another hummingbird. They have amazing abilities. And one of them, of course, is the ability to hover. And no other bird really can hover. Sometimes you see a bird that appears to be hovering, but it's not really hovering for a sustained period. A hummingbird can hover for an hour easily. They really? find themselves so comfortable hovering that a mother hummingbird sitting on her nest, instead of just scooching around, she she elevates herself, hovers, and then turns and then plots back down in, in her little nest. And the way that they are, they become, you know, kings and queens of the air um, really interested me in them. But I was also interested in, you know, their fragility, which is the source of their strength. And what is more fragile than a baby hummingbird? And then I had this opportunity to work with my friend who lives out in California, Brenda Sherburn LaBelle, who is a, ba a baby hummingbird rehabilitator. Oh and she gosh. gets orphaned baby hummingbirds. Sometimes something happens to the mother. It's actually not as often as people might think, but sometimes something does happen to the mother and she can raise these little things. They, they look like, I mean, they hatch the size of bumblebees out of eggs the size of navy beans. And they're these, these naked pink things that you, you couldn't even tell that they're a bird, much less a hummingbird. And she raises them up until, you know, they're capable of these fantastic migrations, this amazing flight. And I had a chance to be part of that. And when Brenda and I were raising the two babies that we took care of, who were Alan's hummingbirds who live in California, we had to feed them every 20 minutes around, well, not around the clock, but from dawn to dusk. And if we did not feed them enough, they would starve. But if we fed them too much, and we fed them by inserting a syringe into their beaks, they would pop. Oh my gosh. They really are made of air. They're just like bubbles fringed with feathers. Oh and it's so scary to take a syringe and it looks like, you know, that you're inserting the top of the Empire State Building into this tiny baby bird's throat. It scares you so much and you're certain he's gonna like cough no. and die and you're gonna do it wrong, it'll be oh. all your fault. Um, but Brenda really knows what she's doing and she's spent a, a great deal of time being properly trained. Um, and it was such a privilege to help these little birds. It, it, it was more than, it was more soul satisfying than I even thought it would be. Mm -hmm. Because what it did was it gave me a hand in resurrection. You know, these animals would have been dead. These glittering little atoms of, of, bright incandescent life. They, they would have been dead in the nest. And to raise them up so that they can own the sky, to have a hand in that, it's just an amazing, fabulous thing to do. And I think that's, that story of being able to assist in a miracle like that is something many of us are hungry for right now coming out of 
a year of feeling isolated and being surrounded with the scary disease. I feel like, you know, if, if we, if just me and Brenda, mere humans, could raise these tiny hummingbirds literally from the dead, surely we, billions of humans, can turn our world around and we can all have a hand in healing. Well, Sai, that is what I love about your work is that there is so much, we are bombarded by so much all the time that's so negative and, and um, you know, there's so much reason to be sad or disappointed, but I believe all of your work seems to be about focusing on the miracle. Because well, there's so many. That's around us all the time as well. It, it's just that we're not reminded of it enough. And mm -hmm. I, that's why I'm so grateful for your work and what you do and your research, your um, your turtle rescue research and program that you're doing. Can you tell us about that? Oh gosh, I can't wait to tell you about it. I'm so thrilled. <laughs> I'm, I'm working with Turtle Rescue League, um, which is run by two wonderful ladies, um, Alex Alexia Bell and Natasha Nowick, out of their basement in a suburban house in suburban Massachusetts. You would never expect that these miracles are happening. They have like 200 turtles down there. And these are turtles wow. who have been injured, you know, run over by cars, for example, turtles that were pets that people have given up, turtles that people just dumped somewhere on some street. Um, oh, you wouldn't believe some of the, <laughs> the turtles that have come to them, like Burmese mountain tortoises. And, oh, so um, it's all turtles. It's not just sea turtles. No, no, it's not just sea oh, turtles. Cool. Wow. All different kinds of turtles, including a ton of snappers. And everybody thinks like, oh, snappers, the devil, they're scary. Well, one of my <laughs> nearest friends is a snapper who weighs 42 pounds. He's a wild snapper. His name is Fire Chief. And I've been working with him uh, doing physical therapy. He was run over. He lived at a fire pond behind a fire um, firehouse. And he usually snappers migrate from their summer pond to their hibernation pond and back. And there's almost nowhere that you can go anywhere today that you're not crossing a road. And a car hit him and his back legs were paralyzed. But now they're moving again. Now he can walk. We just want to get his plaster on his belly shield up a little more. And I can pick him up. I can carry him around. I can pet his head. I could kiss his head if I wanted to, but you know, I don't, I, I don't know if he wants me to kiss his head, but there you know, he is. He, he's a huge guy and he's, he's, he looks like a dinosaur. He's huge, but he's gentle as a puppy. So these turtles, sometimes they need years um, to heal. They have amazing healing powers, but they're turtles. So everything is, is slow with a turtle. So that's the other thing for people to know, because right about now, turtles are starting to cross the roads in search of nesting areas. This is when turtles get run over. The males are crossing, they're, they're going to their summer ponds, they're looking for mates, and the females are looking to lay their eggs. And yet they are disproportionately killed. Um, a lot of times if you see a turtle that's been hit, even if it just looks smashed, that turtle can be saved. But you've got mm. to get it to turtle rescue. You've got With a broken it. shell and everything, it can survive. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I have seen, there's one turtle I know, we call him Mr. Pajamas. I think he's actually a female, but a whole <laughs> bunch of the shell is still missing. But they can actually, they can regrow much of their shells. Oh, the part that overhangs, they can't regrow, but the part that's next to them, they can regrow. Um, turtles who've had like their, their whole front of their shell like removed can survive. Animals who have been hit in the head and look dead, they have lived. We know one girl named Snowball, she's a sweetheart. She was dead. I mean, she had no heartbeat at one point. Um, and she was just re-glued back together by these specialists, Natasha Nowick and Alexia Bell. And they just gave her time and we're gonna be able to release her. She was a dead turtle. And we're going to be able to release her. And not only are we going to be able to release her, but she's going to live another hundred years. You know, she can live a hundred years and she can lay eggs. So it's even, I mean, it's even more exciting than, you know, 
when you rescue a dear little chipmunk, they don't live a hundred years. But these guys live a long, long time and they're going to be contributing to turtle kind for a long, long time. You say on your website that we are on the cusp of either destroying the sweet green earth or revolutionizing the rest of animate creation. Um, the question is, what is your sense of where we are on that learning curve? Well, I think that there's a very big and exciting change afoot in our relationship with other creatures in this world. Now, due to all kinds of scientific breakthroughs and other breakthroughs, I think, in the arts, too, we do recognize that animals are individuals, that they love their lives, that they experience the same emotions that we do, right, you guys? And this is going to change the, our relationship with everyone else in the world. Right now, um, just in, in my lifetime, you know, I was born in 1958. Jane Goodall went into the field to study chimpanzees in 1960, followed by uh, her scientific sisters, um, Diane Fossey, who studied mountain gorillas, and Viruti Galdikas, who studied orangutans. And these three women had a very profound effect on the study of animals because they brought to their understanding of their study animals more than just their intellect, but also their intuition and their emotions. But they did very rigorous science. And so we know that the truth of the world is that animals think and feel and know. And this demands that we treat them differently. And I am thrilled to be alive at this time when I think we are making that change to treat animals as thinking, feeling beings who deserve our respect. Now we know that not only do animals feel, um, but they too have memories and they too can anticipate a future. And Animals that we wouldn't expect to do that have been shown to do that. Cuttlefish and octopuses, you know. Um, we've, we've got to treat them differently once we know that. So the ability to love a sea monster or any other creature for that matter is really giving us a power. Would you say that that's true? And what is that power? What do you think that power is? It's compassion. Mm -hmm. And if we can show that to other animals that we share this world with, then we could certainly, you would think, be able to show it to other people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think compassion is the most powerful force in the universe that we know of. And the more of it that we have, the better things are going to be. It's, it's not as if there's just a tiny little pool of compassion and we can only afford so much. It's a bottomless well. And once we access that, there's no stopping us. Thank you so much, Sai. We so appreciate you being here for Literary Lights and for sharing all of your amazing stories with us. Thank you. I love this conversation. Me too. Let's do it again with butterflies. Oh, yeah, absolutely. When I was a little girl, I announced to my parents, as soon as I could speak, that I was actually a horse. And my mother was very worried and went to the pediatrician and he said that this phase would, would pass and to not worry about it. And it did pass when I discovered that, no, I was actually a dog. Look at that. I'm an, I'm an octopus now. This is great. I hope you enjoyed this literary spotlight and that you will plan to join us in person for Literary Lights on September 19th. You can learn more about the dinner and purchase tickets at literarylights.org.
Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you in September.